So this is Jay Dawes with Elite Sports Services, and I'm the uh, education director for the, the group here. And uh, today we're with Dr. Gene Coleman, and uh, just going to talk about a little bit about his experiences, and uh, you know, kind of pick his brain on some of uh, you know the, the things he's done over the years. So, uh, Coach, you know, I, I think background-wise, we started out fairly similar. Like my uh, first love was baseball. And uh, I was a little fat kid, and uh, you know, all my buddies made the team, and you know, I didn't quite, wasn't quite good enough to do that. So, you know, I kind of started developing an enthusiasm for you know strength conditioning and trying to learn how I could make that next jump and you know, actually make the team. And uh, you know, at that point in time, you know, back in the you know mid '80s, you know, resistance training and strength conditioning wasn't necessarily advocated by a lot of coaches, especially for baseball. But you know, just curious, over the course of your career, like what changes have you seen as far as you know implementing strength conditioning training with baseball players in particular? Well, my first year um, in baseball, I went to spring training with the Astros minor leaguers in uh, 1976, and. Um, they had experimented with uh, Exergenie about a decade before that yeah. and uh, with disastrous results. Right. Um, and so um, their, the, the goal was that we were going to introduce uh, strength training at the minor league level and we were going to start at the double-A team and uh, then see if we could progress up the ladder. And so what we first thing we did was we uh, measured strength. We measured upper body strength and lower body strength in all of our minor league players. And what we found was when we compared them to strength training classes, and I was teaching uh, a couple of strength training classes at the University of Texas in Austin, that they were weaker. So we had professional athletes that were weaker than kids who were starting a strength training class. Not finishing a strength training class, but starting a strength tra training class. Uh, in terms of uh, you know upper body and lower body strength, and this is understandable because you know specificity of training. You know these kids were uh, basically either signing out of high school or signing out of college and had no formal uh, resistance training program. Um, so we continued that for a year, and when they came back to spring training the next year, they had made significant improvements. And the goal then was that we were going to advance up to the next level. So you know, we would take it one year at a time. Um, as it turned out, um, I ended up moving, that was in 76. Um, um, in 77, um, we went back to spring training. As I said, we you know, had recorded those movements, uh, those improvements. And during that summer, uh, we had moved to Houston. And I remember my wife uh, at breakfast was picking up the paper and she said, the, Hey, do you know the Astros major league team is 22 games out of first place? And about uh, noon, I got a phone call from the general manager asking me if I could come down and, and talk with them. So I went down and met with the general manager, the manager, the, the bench coach, and so forth. And they just told me, hey, you know, we're going to move it up. We're going to move up the, the program. We're going to start at the big league level. Uh, when can you start? And I said, well, when's the season going to be over? And they said, well, the season will be over in October, 1st of October. I said, well, then we'll start about you know, two weeks after that. And they said, oh, no, you don't understand. We need to start now. You know, we're 22 games out of first place. And I said, you, know, um, you don't need me today. You need Oral Roberts. All right? <laughs> because I guarantee you, we start a program today, and um, come the end of the season, we're going to be 20 Sorry. games out, 22 games out, 24 games out. You know, it's not going to work any miracles. Yeah. Um, Oh, and then basically strength conditioning is not useful because it didn't, yeah. Right. And um, I said, plus, you know, when it comes time to do this off-season program, you know, they're going to say, oh, we already did that, and mm -hmm. it didn't work. Right. And fortunately, they bought into it, and we did a needs analysis. We, there was, there's no information on baseball, and we were doing, I was working with a, a group of my students and I were working with some people over at NASA, and we were doing astronaut selection. So basically what we did was we took all those tests that we were using for astronaut selection, and brought them into the Astrodome and tested the players. But at that time, the Astros didn't have a radar gun. You know, they weren't measuring you know speed with a stopwatch. Uh, so we brought in metabolic carts. Uh, you know, we did skin folds. We took them out and, and underwater weighed them. Um, and we did that from, I'd say, uh, end of July until September. Uh, so every home team, every home game, you know, a home series, we were we were evaluating something. 
And then our equipment came in in September and we used September to teach them you know, how to utilize the equipment, but not any training. And then we started our formal training in October. So at that time, there were three teams that were doing something. We were doing it, the Reds were doing it, and the Phillies uh, were doing it. And um, that was the start of it. And uh, when you would go on the road, uh, you know, none, with the exception of Cincinnati and Philadelphia, there was no place to work out. Uh, so you had to do push-ups and squats and, you know, body weight type stuff. Um, and now you look at it and almost every major league team now has a weight room in the visiting clubhouse for visiting teams. So, yeah, it's progressed a lot. Yeah, you say that. So, <laughs> well, and that, that's kind of neat to hear the beginnings of it all. And, you know, because I, I know that even you know, to this day, there's some still prevailing thoughts that you're going to get, you know, big bulky muscles and, you know, that's going to hinder your, you know, throwing performance and your ability to, you know, some of the more skill related attributes. And, you know, I think, you know, with a lot of the research that you've done over time, that we've seen that that's just not true. Yeah, no, it's not true. And what we found is, is minds have changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, there, I can't remember the last time I ran into somebody in Major League Baseball, whether it be a scout or a coach or a general manager that was skeptical of, you know, what conditioning would do. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, there are elaborate reporting systems now, you know, the general managers, uh, uh, trainers, managers, and so forth want to know, you know, what, what are their kids doing, uh, how often are they doing it, and then um, they're actually checking on them, you know, as low down as the minor league level, you know, they're getting, getting weekly reports, and if a kid's not doing what he's supposed to be doing, then he gets a phone call from somebody. We got you. Well, and I think, you know, it, as you said, it's, it's starting to become a little bit more prevalent now where people understand the benefits of it, but I think there's still a little bit of confusion about what are the correct things to do. And, you know, we'll, a lot of times I'll we'll talk to athletes and say, you know, you're either built for show or go. So, you know, what are we training for here? And, you know, when you're looking at constructing the strength and conditioning programs, you know, versus, you know, looking athletic versus being athletic, do you get, did you have to fight that battle quite a bit? Um, actually, we didn't, not, not to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that didn't come about until probably the steroid era of the it's 90s. Like <laughs> yeah, you know, and when guys were, you know, wanting to get bigger. Yeah. And, and um, as I said, there weren't many teams doing it. Mm -hmm. And so we sort of had control of, you know, what we were doing. And then as it became more popular and guys started hiring personal trainers, um, then it was when, you know, if you hadn't educated them before, you really had to start at that point in time. And so today, you know, I heard the other day from uh, one of our minor league uh, coaches that you know, they were having trouble with a player. And that player, um, you know, was wanting to do more of a bodybuilding program than their type of program. So you still hear about it, but it, you know, it's isolated now as compared to, you know, somewhat rampant uh, during the, the, the mid nineties and so forth when everybody was hitting home runs and trying to look, you know, huge. Right. And we were very fortunate in that uh, with the Astros, we always had players that, you know, understood what was going on and they would take a player to the side mm -hmm. and uh, sort of, you know, reading the riot act and explain, you know, what was expected of them. So right. they policed themselves. Yeah, which is always better. It's nice to have uh, more sets of eyes than just one. And plus, again, I think with the team norms, you know, what norms your team established as far as what's going to be acceptable behavior and things of that nature probably goes a lot further away than just being dictated from top down. So. Yeah, my, my goal was always, you know, I tell the players, you know, I want to, I want to get you prepared enough, to, you understand enough that uh, I work myself out of a job. You don't right. need me. It's you know, 38 years later and, you know, we're still going, so but some of them have learned, and, but, but the vast majority still need guidance. Right. Now, what about as far as the conditioning aspects of it? Because, you know, I, I know when I was a pitcher, you know, our coaches, you know, uh, the big thing that we ended up getting to do the day after and, you know, trying to lead up to the season was going out for massive distance running. And, you know, I, intuitively, I think, you know, as we were on these runs, you know, I'm out there with all my buddies and going like, God, why are we running five miles a day? I don't have to do that on the mound. So, you know, I think there's been kind of a, a shift as far as, you know, looking at how we condition for that and, you know, energy system development and things of that nature. So uh, approach-wise, when you're conditioning, you know, your, your pitchers and, you know, other position players, what approach do you take with that? Well, our approach is, you know, short intervals. And, um, you know, we, we tell them that if you spend 80% of your time jogging, you spend 80% of your time practicing being slow. You're working the wrong muscle groups. 
um, you're working the wrong fiber types and you're working the wrong energy system and you're working the wrong hormonal system. So you're doing everything bass backwards. And some people are, you know, are successful in spite of what they do. Right. But you know, given it's genetically gifted. Yeah. Right. You yeah. know, given the choice, there will be players who would prefer to go out and you know jog long, slow distance because that's a lot easier to do than doing intervals. But we try to focus everything on 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 interval training and um, a lot of change of direction activities. Um, so we're trying to work on the ATP PC system as opposed to the oxygen transport system. And we're trying to improve work capacity as opposed to aerobic capacity. Right. Well, and, and you know, as far as, you know, especially pitching goes, you know, it's such a anaerobically dominated activity. I mean, you know, what a pitch, even with the windup is less than five seconds, right? So I, I guess looking at it from an aerobic standpoint, that recovery between pitches becomes important. But I mean, you can develop most of that with, you know, anaerobic conditioning, correct? Absolutely. And that's, that's what we're telling our, our pitchers. Um, and, you know, I, I think the original theory behind long, slow distance running was going, you're going to rid your body of lactic acid. Right. But there are two uh, problems with that theory. And one is that you don't develop a lactic acid during pitching. Right. And second is if you did, it would have been already dissipated by the time, right. you know, the, the day off came. Right. Very cool. Now, as far as you know, we were kind of talking earlier about kids and, and grandkids and things of that nature and developmentally, you know, if, if you you know, had coaches and whatnot that are working with kids that are in the younger levels, you know, high school and, you know, before that, what would you recommend to them as far as trying to get them prepared for hitting those upper levels of performance? Well, in, in what I'm working with with my grandkids now is, um, number one is being able to control their own body weight. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you know, are you strong enough to control your own body weight? Um, and, you know, in other words, can you squat and can you do push-ups and can you do a plank and can you do a lateral plank so that we can maintain that stability so that, you know, we can, uh, we can pr produce some force. Uh, the second thing is, can you start, stop, and change directions? You know, and are your, are your mechanics good? Um, because you can't recover from a bad start. And it, does, it doesn't make any difference whether you're, you know, you're trying to run to first base or whether you're trying to avoid a run down or you're trying to change directions because you misjudge a fly ball. If you have a bad start, you're not gonna be able to recover for it. So, you know, do you have proper mechanics? And can we teach these mechanics in a fun way? You know, make it game-like, and so that you know they're learning in spite of themselves. Right on. Well, and I think those things that you know, like kids don't understand why they're doing certain things. And if you say, well, we're developing your anaerobic energy system, they don't care. You know, and with uh, so I have three kids at home, all under the age of 12, and every single one of them has been in gymnastics for years. And, and a lot of it's that same reason. It's like I want them to develop the body awareness, the good. Uh, ability to you know move their body in time and space and things of that nature. Then hopefully you know should they choose to you know be in athletics, which you know dad secretly hopes they will, uh, that they're able to be uh, you know better skilled at whatever uh, sport they may choose. And you know I, I think with some of the younger kids, you know sport you know early specialization is one of those things where you know I think. You know, probably a decade ago, we kind of got in that trap where kids thought that the way to get really, really good at a sport was specialized really early in it, which kind of intuitively would make some sense because if you want to get really good at something, you devote a lot of time and effort to it. But I think, as you said, you know, looking at that good multilateral development now really can have a big impact as far as just overall long-term, um, you know, the, the levels they can actually reach. Absolutely. You know, uh, agility, balance, coordination, you know, each of those attributes you know, when you go to apply it, it's different when you apply it in baseball than when you apply it in football. And it's different in gymnastics, it's different in basketball. So the more exposure you can get, the more activities you can do, you get, uh, you know, the better you're going to be, you know, when and if you ever come to specialize. And I like to put a ball in it because, you know, if you can put a ball or if you can make it game-like, you know, uh, kids will really, you know, they'll buy into it. Uh, and adult kids will buy into it also. Oh, yeah. And uh, you know, I think two, two of the, one of the things that's really helped my grandkids with agility, um, change of direction, and work capacity is that they got a dog. <laughs> and that dog likes to, you know, they, they, try, they chase him, they try to catch him, and you know, it's like Rocky chasing the chicken. Yeah, that's what getting ready to say. Yeah, I mean, exactly. they, they are totally out of breath, and, you know, yeah. and they're doing all the right moves. And as, as uh, Lauren says, sometimes from the wrong position, yeah. but they're doing, you know, they're, they're making the right movement patterns. Uh, and they're working on their work capacity and they're having a good time and the dog is thoroughly enjoying it. Yeah, exactly. Well, and it's, it takes the emphasis off that sets and reps and you know, work dress intervals and durations and all that stuff and puts the emphasis back on fun and, you know, trying to actually accomplish tasks. And I think, you know, kids are such concrete thinkers 
that, you know, again, if you go in there and try and say, hey, these are the specific attributes to work on, they're not going to get that. If you go, hey, run down there as fast as you can, you know, shoot a basket, run down here and try and shoot another one, they can kind of get that a little bit better. Absolutely. So as far as, uh, you know, going back to some of the stuff you did, you know, with the Astros and, you know, currently doing with the Rangers and whatnot, so testing-wise, you know, you said you would looked at profiling over the years and, you know, early on how that, you know, kind of developed. How has that changed? over the years and what are some of the key attributes you look at now as far as what do you see being some of the biggest predictors of success? Well, I, I, I think uh, the, the three predictors that I like um, and um, one of them is vertical jump because mm -hmm. right? that's an index of power and we have data that's been published, uh, Jay Hoffman and, and some of the I think strength coaches from five or six major league teams um, published data on about 1,500 professional athletes from rookie ball to the major leagues. And vertical jump is a predictor of power and that is directly correlated to power at the plate. You know, right. home runs, uh, extra base hits, on base percentage and so forth. Um, and then speed in the 10 yards. Uh, 10 yard speed is highly correlated with uh, the ability to steal bases and total number of bases and so forth. Right, and, and power as well. Yeah, so, and yeah. power as well. And then the third is uh, the uh, shuttle, uh, uh, lateral speed and agility. So um, some sort of pro agility run. And that has been directly correlated with some of our indices of uh, fielding success, and which is you know, back to range of motion and so forth, uh, and, and distance covered. And, and so, you know, those kinds of things. And then, you know, something as simple as grip strength has also been shown to be, you know, highly correlated to power production. So, you know, you can do a number of elaborate types of things, but in a pinch, you know, how fast can you run? How quickly can you change directions? You know, do you have a firm handshake? And how, 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 how high can you jump? Well, that's the thing, you know, I think we can get as sophisticated as you want to get. I think that's the thing I've noticed over the years is, you know, sports science keeps getting more and more complicated which can be a good thing, but also, like you said, can be a detriment at the same time because a lot of it, you get so bogged down in all the data and all the numbers and things like that that you forget about the eyeball test and, you know, going, hey, you know, this doesn't look quite right. How do we go in and fix that? And I think before, earlier, we were talking about, you know, some of the different, uh, you know, tools and, you know, ways to look at physiological monitoring and, and things of that nature. You know, just want to get kind of your thoughts on, on some of those um, techniques and methods that are being used right now. Yeah, and you know, um, some of them are good, and some of them are so elaborate that you have to have additional staff members. Mm -hmm. um, I know that um, one of my friends is, a, is an NBA coach, and he said that one of the techniques that they were using um, indicated that the player that they thought was the laziest player on the team was moving the most in practice. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it contradicted what they saw as coaches and so having four coaches with a total of over 100 years of experience, you know, they all said this guy's lazy in the yeah. test or the equipment said, showed yeah, showed yeah. that he was yeah. moving the most and they didn't buy it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it, you know, it didn't support, you know, their opinions. Right. And so sometimes as a coach, you know, the machine says one thing, um, but players know how to cheat. Yeah, well, it's funny. We were doing some uh, testing back when I was in South Texas, looking at some uh, ice hockey players, which you can imagine how popular that is down there. But, you know, we had uh, heart rate monitors on them during a game situation, and we had this one kid that he uh, was getting his heart rate up pretty darn high, like close to his you know theoretical max. Like he's pushing 200 the whole time, and you know he was trying to make the argument to the coaches on paper. He's like, "Well, see, guys, yeah, I'm working really hard here. I'm you know working at a high level." I'm like, "Well, yeah, it's because you're getting beaten like you stole something." It's like, so that's not a good thing. We need you less work less hard and be more energy efficient and you know conserve that energy better. So it, it is one of the things like a lot of times all these numbers you can get a little bit dazzled by them, and sometimes they, unless you look at them with that common sense perspective, they don't always mean what you think they mean. Yeah, we've uh, we've done heart rate. Uh, the first time I did heart rate, I was uh, at Texas Tech, and we took their basketball players and. We found a couple of interesting things, and, and one was a player sitting on the bench has a, you know, a heart rate down here, and the guy playing has a heart rate here. And when they go change places, one goes in and one goes out, you know, there's an emotional effect. You know, his heart rate immediately went up, and this guy's immediately went down. Uh, the another thing we saw was a guy shooting a free throw, his heart rate is high. If he makes it, uh, his heart rate immediately drops. Yeah. If he misses it, it immediately goes up even higher. And the, the coach said, oh, that's because he's, you know, we've coached him so well that he's getting in position to get the rebound. 
and the, and the psychological, psychological and the, stress, is it? And, and, no, and, 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 the, and the player said, no, it's uh, because we're looking over at the bench because if you miss a shot, so you're looking to see who's coming in. So, right. you know, you, you get different things. And then we did, I think, four major league games. We did the pitching coach, the hitting coach, the third base coach, and the manager. And we did their heart rates through four, four games. And what we found was when we were hitting, the hitting coach's heart rate was up and the pitching coach's heart rate was down, <laughs> and vice versa. Uh, but the manager was always high. You know? There you go. Yeah. Uh, so it buck stops there at the end of the day. No yeah, and that day. that was supported by uh, some of the work we did with basketball, in that we looked at the coach and the referee, mm -hmm. and the referee running up and down the court had a had a lower resting had a lower heart rate than the coach sitting on the bench. So <laughs> there, there's a lot of emotional involvement there. But one of the things that came out of that was the coach started uh, you know working out. Uh, try, trying to control his heart rate a little bit more. Yeah. yeah, yeah, trying to get some sort of sympathetic control here. Yeah, no kidding. Well, that's great. So, you know, looking at, uh, you know, again, advice. You've got a you know, young strength and conditioning professional who's wanting to get into, you know, being a strength coach in baseball, especially you know, at the major league level. What would you recommend for them as far as those next steps? Well, uh, number one, you know, they, they absolutely have to be certified because they won't take anybody without that. Uh, number two, they have to have experience, all right, and they should get experience in baseball, whether it's working with a college team or, uh, or independent team or somewhere along that line. And then third, they need to expect that you know they're going to have to do an internship, uh, probably at a minor with a minor league team. <laughs> uh, that usually convinces most coaches that they don't want to be involved in baseball because you know, even at the minor leagues, it's 142 games in 160 right, yeah. days, and half of those are on the road and you know you're hunting and picking for places to work out yeah. um, and you know the game is over at 11 o'clock or midnight and you're getting back to your room you know at you know one o'clock in the morning or thereabouts and then if you if the place that you're visiting doesn't have a weight room then you've got a bus and you're taking on around 11 o'clock you know to a 24-hour fitness or you yeah. know some private gym to work out uh, so it's uh, extremely long hours um, and um, little pay yeah. uh, so you better be sure that this is something that you know not only you but your entire family wants to buy into yeah right on well and I think that you know you, you hit on two things there's like you know one is gonna be that adaptability and you know we always say that there's a reason why the dinosaurs are extinct is they couldn't adapt so you know being able to do the best you can with the situation that you're given and you know realizing hey this is ideal but that's not what we got here so what's the next best thing in a pinch I, I, ideal doesn't even exist in the major leagues. Yeah. You know. uh, my very first day on the job, our manager was a former Marine, Bill Verdon, and Bill was, was hard-nosed, and he'd been in the game a long time, and he told me the first day, he said, I'm going to give you one word, and if you can take this word and apply it, you'll have a long career. If you can't, you might not make the day, and that word is adjust. You know? He said, players have to adjust, you know, pitch to pitch, at bat to at bat, game to game, week to week, season to season. He said, you may have the best workout planned, you know, uh, and, and back then we were working out after the game. He said, but the game may go into extra innings and the guys are too tired. Or we may have a quick bus, you know, and so there isn't enough time to, you know, to get the workout done. Or maybe the player or players you want to work with got hurt that day mm -hmm. you know, or got a nagging injury and need ice and they can't do that. Or maybe I called a team meeting, you know, and everybody's so hacked off at me, you know, they don't want to go work out, you know. Or maybe the guy had a bad day, you know, and he'd yeah, rather go, go, yeah, he'd rather go, go home. So he said, if you can't adjust, you know, then you're not going to make it. Yeah. Well, and then the other part of that is like you, you talk about the grind. I mean, probably unlike any other sport, just the duration of a season with, with Major League Baseball. I mean, it's got to take a toll not only, you know, physically, but emotionally, psychologically. You know, from a recovery standpoint, what are some things that you, you know, did and would encourage for, you know, athletes in that, that area? Well, one of the things that we tried to do was we tried to get our guys to do some sort of stretching exercise after the game. And, and what we basically told them was, you know, uh, during the game, you know, you start the game and your muscles are this long. And after the game, they're this long. All right. And if you go home and go to bed, they're going to be this long when you get up in the morning. But if you can get them from here to here, when you get up, go, get up the next morning, they, may, so they might want yeah. to hear. So you're starting from a lower, uh, from a higher, higher, higher initial point. Yeah. Um, you know, we did that. And then towards the end, as more and more information came into existence uh, about the importance of nutrition mm -hmm. and recovery, um, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that we got, you know, some fluid and we got, you know, a mixture of carbohydrate and protein in them. 
while they were working out. Uh, because typically what will happen in a, in, with a professional team is if they're going to work out after the game is they'll immediately come off the field, get out of their uniform, go to the weight room, and once they leave there, then they go get you know ice or treatment if, if it's needed, and then they go eat. So it might be 45 minutes to an hour before they actually get to eat. So we were feeding them as soon as they, you know, as soon as they came into the weight room. If we had a starting pitcher, we were feeding them, uh, and they're not going to be hungry. So we were feeding them, you know, fluid uh, meals um, when they came in after, you know, if they came in after the fifth inning or sixth inning or seventh inning, they were getting it right then while they were, you know, icing their elbow or their shoulder or whatever. And we're trying to set the stage for a quicker recovery. Right. Well, and what about that as far as like environment and things like that goes? Cause, I mean, playing in the Astrodome is probably be a lot different than playing in you know California in the middle of the summertime. So, how did that influence you know strategies and, and things of that nature? Well, it, it, was, it, it depended on where you were. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you know, whenever we the, the Texas Rangers as a team work out before the game, mm -hmm. all right, and you know it's it's 90, 95 degrees, you know, 70 percent relative humidity, mm -hmm. and if you're going to wait till after the game, you're not going to get much out of it. You know, yeah. you're going to be tired, dehydrated, and so forth. So whenever we went into Arlington in, in interleague play, we always worked out before the game. Mm -hmm. right? uh, Atlanta, we work out before the game. Um, um, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, you know, sometimes before the game. Uh, St. Louis, sometimes before the game. Depending upon, you know, uh, a July trip into St. Louis is going to be different than an April trip into St. Right. Louis. Right? Right. And then you have things like day games after night games. Yeah. You know, uh, there's not actually enough recovery time to recover. Uh, so you finish the game, and then if you're going to work out, and then you're going to have a day game, there's not really enough time to recover. So, you know, the, the consensus has always, always been, you know, we're not going to work out, you know, uh, on the night before we have a day game. So we'll give ourselves give ourselves a chance to recover. And then depending on where the day game is, you know, and how long it went, don't work out after extra inning games. Yeah. You know, uh, don't work out for double headers. Yeah. Better um, give them time to recover. Than yeah. The, it's, yeah. yeah it, they're, they will get more out of the recovery than they would out of the workout. Because, you know, the thing that you know, players don't understand is that growth occurs during recovery, mm -hmm. not during the workout. Right. And so it's stress, stress, and no recovery. Um, <laughs> Probably the best player I ever worked with and the, and the closest friend I ever made in baseball is Nolan Ryan. And Nolan, the hard thing we had with Nolan was convincing him that work and rest are both important and neither is beneficial without the other. In other words, Nolan, if Nolan had a, had a bad outing, he wanted to go work, yeah. you know. And um, the, the thing that finally convinced him was he came up to me in the Astrodome one day during batting practice and um, he had injured his wrist on his non-throwing hand somehow or another, and it wasn't severe, but he told me that, or that it was, his wrist was sore and that the doctor told him that um, if he would apply friction massage to it, it would keep it warm and it, you know, it would get well sooner. And he walks off and about 15 minutes later he comes back and he's got a blister about the size of a face of a watch on his hand. And I said, what is that? And he said, oh, I was rubbing on it and a blister came up. And I said, well, didn't it get hot? And he said, yeah. I said, well, why didn't you stop? He said, well, thought if a little bit's good, a whole lot would be better. <laughs> so the next day I put in his locker a, a, a belt sander and put Nolan Ryan friction massager. If a little bit's good, a whole lot's going to be better. Nice. And, and he got the concept, you know. Yeah. And after that, uh, you know, he went on and pitched another 15 years. Yeah. Well, and, and honestly, man, I got to talk to you about that because just that's, growing up, Nolan was my hero. And you know, I think that was for me as a young kid who you know was interested in pitching and whatnot. You know, I read the book by you know Tom House that he and you know Tom put together and, and whatnot. Just looking at your know, work ethic, and I think that was the one thing that people talked about so much with him was you know his work ethic, then just his flawless technique as far as the duration of his career. And you know, from firsthand experience, I mean, how can you speak to that a little bit more? Well, I'll tell you the, f the first time I met Nolan, I, I get a call from the general manager. This was in the off season prior to the 1980 season, and he says, "Hey, you know, we've signed Nolan Ryan." and um, uh, we're having a reception and we'd like for you to come meet him. So I'm standing there talking to uh, one of our starting pitchers, Kenny Forge, and I'm trying to get, this is 1979, right? and I've been in the big leagues two years, and I'm trying to get our pitchers to lift one time between starts. Right. So they pitch every fifth day, so we lift the second day. And the only guy that hasn't bought in is Kenny Forge. Right? I mean, he, he's doing it but with you know, a lot of duress. 
And so I'm standing there talking to Kenny and Nolan walks up and he says, um, you're the strength coach. And I said, yep. He said, well, I'm going to have a problem with your weightlifting program. And Kenny Forrest went ear to ear. <laughs> and Nolan said, yep, I can only lift twice between starts. Oh, wow. And we became, we became instant friends <laughs> at, at, at that moment. Um, and then it progressed to, you know, he was lifting five times between starts, but yeah. he lifted five times between starts. Uh, uh, Clements, you know, was a, was a product of Nolan. He was yeah. five times between starts. Andy Pettit was five times. You know, it's not always five times, you know, a maximal type effort, sure. but they're doing something, you know. Uh, the four days before they pitch and, you know, oftentimes doing something before they go out to the mound or in Clements' case, after he came out of the game uh, to get ready for the next start. And Nolan's philosophy was you should never get beat because the other opposition is better prepared than you are. And, you know, it doesn't mean whether they get more sleep or they ate better or, you know, whatever. He said the only thing that you could control is how you prepare. You can't control the weather, you can't control the opposition, you can't control whether they, you know, they put the mound together or the umpire had a right strike zone. Or Sometimes you just can't even control where the ball is going. Uh, but you can control how you prepare, and you shouldn't get beat because the other guy's better prepared. And then the second thing, we, we sat down and we talked about, you know, what made Nolan Ryan stand out from everybody else. And I've had a lot of people say, oh, man, you know, you really did a lot for Nolan. I said, yeah, I really did. You know, he had only 3,500 strikeouts when I met him. So, <laughs> um, But Nolan came down to three things um, in, in his mind. And... Number one was genetics, right? And nobody in his family was an athlete, uh, so he just happened to fall in the right gene pool. Um, number two was work ethic. Um, you know, you, you shouldn't get beat because somebody's better prepared. Uh, and then number three was proper mechanics. Uh, you can't throw, you know, you can't run a mile with a rock in your shoe, and you can't throw as long as he did and as hard as he did you know, without good mechanics, you know, something's going to break down. When he came to Houston in 1980, he and I sat down and he had thrown over 100,000 pitches over 90 miles an hour. Um, and, you know, now if a guy throws 100 pitches in a game, he's out of the game. Uh, Nolan, in his prime of his career with the Angels, he told me a good day for him was 160 pitches a game. You know, a typical game was 180 pitches, and you know he once threw 255. Wow. Right? But the thing about it was that he was doing all this on three days rest, and yeah. now we can't do it on four days rest. Right. Um, so he said, you just simply can't. You know, you can't repeat that. Yeah. You know, um, and then you know, Clements learned from Nolan. Nolan learned from Koufax and Seaver. Um, but, you know, Clements always said that, you know, every year there's some phenom that, you know, that's coming along and he's throwing 95 or 98 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, if it doesn't do you any good to throw 95 or 98 when you're 20, if you can't do it when you're 30, mm -hmm. and it doesn't do any good to throw it in May if you can't throw it because you're on the disabled list in July or August. And so if you want to throw 95, when you're 30 or 35, you know, you need to start working on it when you're, you know, before you reach 20 or 25, yeah. you know, you, you need to work out. Yeah, well, just that sustainability factor, because like you said, I mean, I think, and if memory serves, and you can certainly correct me on this, but Nolan, I mean, he was the first guy who was throwing up into his 40s that hard and that consistent, you know, I mean, at least to my knowledge. Yeah, there's, a, I have a friend, Frank Tanana, and he was on that staff with Nolan, and I see Frank from time to time, and uh, Frank said that, uh, he threw 95 in 75 and 75 in 95. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's, I mean, as far as, you know, uh, you know, obviously Nolan had a great work ethic and things of that nature with, you know, his strength conditioning program, things like that. As far as, you know, rehabilitation, prehabilitation, you know, what were some, you know, key factors you think may have kind of helped contribute to, to his success and the success of all the other pitchers you've worked with? Well, I think one of the, one of the successes is that Dr. Job came up with the mm -hmm. with the idea of you know rotator cuff exercises because prior to prior to Dr. Job you know nobody was really doing it right. uh, and um, you know we didn't have Tommy John surgeries and we didn't have other kind of surgeries surgeries because when you got hurt 
there was nothing you know that they really did mm -hmm. and so guys just retired and yeah. went, went to work but you know with the salaries being what they are you know a guy gets hurt you want him to you know to improve and we have guys that you know, you know if, if I see a guy says he's going to have Tommy John surgery I tell him to have John Smoltz surgery because you know Tommy John was throwing maybe 80 when he had surgery and he came yeah. back throwing 78 and John Smoltz was throwing 92 and he came back throwing 98 so he needed to do <laughs> yeah, um, so I think that's one, one aspect. Um, the other is that the better shape that you're in, you know, the less stress you're going to have on your body. And if you can work that connection between the lower body, upper body, and going through the core, uh, that's really going to help you. Nolan and Roger Clements, I mean, they were big believers you know, and having a st strong, stable core from which their arms and legs could work. Well, makes total sense. Well, and, you know, I, I think, you know, again, just looking at it over the years and, and things of that nature, you, you talked about you know, limiting pitch counts and, and things like that. Do you think that's been a benefit or a hindrance in some ways? Um, no, time will tell. Yeah. Um, in the old days, everybody threw a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if, if you look at... Seaver and and Nolan and and Ferguson Jenkins and uh, Steve Carlton and Fernando Valenzuela, you know those guys were you know 150, 160 pitches a game. You know, never pitched, uh, never missed a ro you know spot in the rotation. Um, I think one year Ferguson Jenkins had I think 36 starts in Wrigley Field in Chicago. So those are day games. Um, and I think he had 29 complete games or something like that. Won the Cy Young, um, had the lowest ERA in baseball. Um, you know, they were prepared to do that. Uh, Nolan's a big believer that if you haven't prepared to do that when you're young, uh, and then you get into the professional ball and you, you try to do it, you don't have the background. You haven't built that base from which, you know, you can work. And a lot of kids now, when you look at them, you know, they're coming through the draft. And you look at them and you're saying, you know, we've got to pitch every fifth day in the big leagues if you're a starting pitcher, maybe every day or three days in a row if you're in the bullpen. And these kids are coming in and they pitch, you know, maybe six innings every six days or, you know, they, they don't go over seven innings or something other like that. And you're trying to figure out, you know, how are you going to progress these guys up to, you know, throwing 120, 150 pitches in a game when they're coming out of the game, you know, at, at 70 pitches. Um, I had a manager, Larry Durkert, one time said, you know, um, we had this pitcher named Shane Reynolds who's probably maybe yeah. the best conditioned player I've ever had as a pitcher. And he said, why can't Shane ever get into the eighth inning? And I said, because you keep taking him out in the seventh. <laughs> you know, if you want. <laughs> Got to grind through it, yeah. If you yeah. want him to pitch in the eighth, let him, let him go out there, you know. Yeah. yeah. Now, what about some of the hitters, like, uh, I mean, like Glenn Davis and, you know, some of those guys? Yeah, as far as, like, you know, training condition programs, like, how do they differ from, you know, your pitchers? Well, um, you know, power hitters, you, you train a power hitter different than you would train a pitcher or different than you would train a shortstop or a second baseman or something like that. Because they, you know, they're, they're bangers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're not expected to cover a whole lot of ground, right. uh, but they're expected to hit the ball hard. Mm -hmm. And um, so I would say the best conditioned position player that I ever came in contact with was Jeff Bagwell. And Baggy was, he was built like a cement block. Yeah. And uh, he was, you know, he was strong as an ox, and he lifted very heavy, and he lifted very often. Yeah. And um, I can't tell you the number of New Year's Eves that I spent either in the Astrodome or Minute Maid, um, either a New Year's Eve because he wanted to get in the last workout, or New Year's Day because you know he wanted start to right. he wanted to start out right. Yeah. Um, and I, I can remember one time um, we were. We were playing um, on a, a Thursday night. I think we were Wednesday or Thursday night. We were an ESPN game of the whatever it was. And we got beat by the Cubs like 14 to 2 or something other like that. And Sammy Sosa hit three or four home runs. And, and Baggy took an 0 for 4 with about three strikeouts. And his index of strength was he was, he liked to bench press three by 335. Right. And so our goal was by the last off-season workout, he would do three by 335. Mm -hmm. The last day of spring training, three by 335, all-star break, three by 335, and then 
sometime in late September, three by three thirty-five. That, he, he, yeah, yeah, that was his yeah. measuring stick stick of how strong he was. And so we were scheduled that night. It was in late in September. He was going to do his three by three thirty-five, and the game went on for like four hours. And they opened the roof early, so it was hot and humid. And um, as we were leaving the dugout, I said, "Hey, Baggy, let's do this tomorrow." And he said, no, uh, we're going to do it tonight. We have it scheduled for tonight. We will do it tonight. He said, get those young kids in. So we had a couple of young kids that were September call-ups. And so I got them and I said, hey, look, just you know, stand around. Don't get near where Baggy is, but just stand around and, you know, um, where you can see. Get someplace where you can see. And Baggy gets under the bar and he said, um, i got to get this up. And I said, why? He said, I have to make a good impression on the young kids. Yeah. And he does it and he walks out. And then I told him, I said, do you know how hard it is to lift three by 335, you know, in December, you know, at 11 o'clock in the morning after you've had a good night's sleep? And, I mean, this guy's been here since noon, you know, yeah. and he's had a horrible day. The game's gone on forever. It's hot and it's humid. And all he wanted to do was make a good impression on you. And you don't have to lift 300 pounds. You don't have to bench press, but you have to do something, yeah. you know. Well, and what about as far as like work ethic and you know just creating that culture? And it sounds like you you had some players that were just rock solid as far as you know their ability to go in and do work and to to get people to rally around them and buy into that. Yeah, my, my first job, I was very fortunate. You know, we had we had players that wanted the program. Um, uh, Bob Watson, uh, J.R. Richard, um, Jose Cruz, uh, and Jose. I am still friends with all of those guys, but. They wanted the program. They were the guys that went to the general manager and said, hey, we need to do something. Uh, so we started with them, and that was 78. And then Nolan rolled around in 80. Mm -hmm. And then we had Nolan for you know, nine years. And um, you know, after that, we had Ken Caminetti, yeah. uh, Craig Biggio, Jeff Bagwell, you know, and then more recently, you know, Hunter Pence. Mm -hmm. So we always had somebody. You know, and these were guys that would would go around to the younger guys and say, "Hey, you know, you need to be in there. If I'm going to be in there, you're going to be in there." And so you really didn't have to do a whole lot of arm twisting. You yeah. Know? And then we've been very fortunate that we always had managers that were were very supportive. And you know, would come to you and say, uh, "Is so and so doing his job? Do I need to talk to him?" And my philosophy was, I'm not doing my job if you have to talk to him. <laughs> right. um, and I always told players, you know, I will not, you know, I'll not tattle on you, but if I'm asked, I won't lie for you. Right. So, and you know, they, you know, they, they appreciated that. Yeah. Uh, and they still, you know, players still appreciate that. And then the other thing was, you know, the ability to have players police themselves. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you have a problem with somebody, you know, you just go to uh, a team leader and they'll go talk, go talk to the guy. And it, the results are usually much better that way. Right. That's great. Well, Coach, we've taken a lot of your time today. Hey, I really appreciate it. And like I said, just getting to talk to you about all this stuff is a thrill. Like I said, you know, with, with my background and, you know, my love of baseball and, you know, strength conditioning as well, you know, getting to have you here really combines, you know, both those loves together. So I really do appreciate your time. Oh, it's my pleasure. So, Enjoyed it. All right, sir. Appreciate you. Thank you.